Hi there, I'm Mrs F and this is my lesson on the Nazi police state. Although I'm following the Edexcel specification, a lot of the content is also relevant to other exam boards. In my previous lesson, I finished looking at how Hitler created a, di a dictatorship. And in this lesson, I'm going to have a look at the Gestapo, SS, SD, concentration camps and Nazi control of the legal system. The German state that Hitler created after 1933 was a police state. And this was a state in which the Nazi government used the police, usually the secret police, to control what people did and what they said. People who did or said anything to harm the state or the Nazi party were punished. Now, of course, when Hitler became Chancellor in January 1933, Germany already had a police force. It was controlled by central government, but run by local authorities in Germany's states and towns. And because in January 1933, Hitler's control of government was still weak, he realised that his control of the police was also weak. And so Hitler decided to set up his own police and security forces that were not run by the government. Instead, they were run by the Nazi party and accountable to Hitler. The main organisations that Hitler used were the SS, the SD and the Gestapo. And at first, they were separate Nazi organisations, but gradually they were organised into the structure that you can see on the right hand side of the screen. And we're going to look at each of them in turn. The SS was originally a group of 240 men who were set up as a personal bodyguard for Hitler in 1925, just after the Munich Putsch. From 1929, it was put under the control of Heinrich Himmler, who we see on the right hand side of the screen. In 1932, they were given their famous black uniforms to help distinguish them from the brown shirts or the SA. In the early 1930s, their main role became the Nazis private police force and they were totally loyal to Hitler and to Himmler. You might remember in our previous lesson that it was the SS who warned Hitler about Rome in 1934 and it was SS officers who murdered SA leaders during the Night of the Long Knives. It went from being a very small group to a group of about 240,000 men and it was put in charge <coughs> sorry, of all the other police and security forces. <coughs> sorry, need to clear my throat there. Himmler didn't believe that the SS were obliged to act within the law and he was very particular about recruitment. He wanted perfect examples of German manhood who would be expected to marry racially pure wives and create racially pure Germans for the future. It's funny when we look at that picture of him, like, because he doesn't really fit what I would consider the ideal of perfect manhood, but there we go. The SD, or security force, was actually formed in 1931 by Himmler to be a security force for the Nazi party to monitor its opponents. And he made Reinhard Heydrich its leader. Interestingly enough, Hitler himself called him the man with the iron heart. And if Hitler gives you a nickname like that, then it really shows you how evil this man was. And he would eventually be involved in deciding on the policy of the Holocaust. The SD kept a card index with details of everyone it suspected of opposing the German government at home or abroad. And these weren't kept at government buildings, but at the Nazi headquarters in Munich. The Gestapo was Hitler's plain clothes secret police force. Now they were set up in 1933 by Hermann Goering, who at that time was the chief of the ordinary police. But in 1934, it was placed under SS control. And in 1936, 
Heydrich, who was also um, the leader of the SD, was also put in charge of the Gestapo. So from 1936, Hitler had created a unified police and security force with the SS, the SD and the Gestapo working in parallel to it. Now, the main aim of the Gestapo was to identify anyone who criticised or opposed the Nazi government. They spied on people, tapped their phones and used networks of informants to identify suspects. In just 1939 alone, 160,000 people were arrested for political offences. The Gestapo were officially given permission to use torture when questioning suspects or gaining confessions. The main weapon of the Gestapo was fear. And the Gestapo were particularly feared because of the fact that they were plain clothed and therefore they could not be told apart from other members of the public. What added to the fear was that they often arrived early in the morning to take suspects away. And the fact that offenders would be imprisoned without trial, with families just getting a letter through the post saying that their relatives had died in custody. Many were sent to concentration camps, which we'll look at in the next slide. And when rumours leaked out about conditions in the concentration camps, fear of the Gestapo grew even more. We could argue that fear of Hitler's police forces was even more powerful than the police forces themselves. There were actually never more than 30,000 Gestapo to police a population of about 80 million. Instead, what they really relied on was the cooperation of the German public. Only around 10% of political crimes committed were discovered by the Gestapo, and another 10% were passed on to the Gestapo by the regular police or the Nazi party. What that means is around 80% was discovered by ordinary citizens sorry, who turned the information over. And even more bizarrely, most of this unpaid cooperation came from people who were not even members of the Nazi party. Perhaps they wanted to deflect um, attention away from themselves or perhaps they had a grudge with a neighbour and this was a way of getting revenge. By 1939, 150,000 people were under protective arrest in prisons. And what this means is they hadn't committed criminal acts, but they had been locked up for doing things that the Nazis disapproved of such as voicing views opposed to Hitler and the Nazis. Now, because of the massive increase in the prison population, it meant that concentration camps were created to house the inmates. The very first Nazi concentration camp opened at Dachau, a former army barracks outside Munich, in April 1933. The camps were deliberately located in isolated areas, away from the public's gaze. The inmates of the concentration camps were so-called undesirable groups, such as prostitutes or homosexuals, minority groups, such as Jews and Romani Gypsies, and political prisoners, such as intellectuals, communists, and trade unionists. At the bottom of the screen there, you can see a picture of a German journalist who spoke out against the Nazi regime and was sent to a concentration camp not long after the Reichstag fire. When the Red Cross visited him in 1935, they described him as a trembling, pale creature, one eye swollen, teeth knocked out, dragging a broken, badly healed leg. Karl von Ossietzky was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his journalism in 1936, but he wasn't allowed out of prison to receive his award. Instead, two years later, he died in police custody, suffering from tuberculosis. 
And it's important for me to stress that before the outbreak of the Second World War, concentration camps were not the death camps that we kind of associate with the Holocaust. It was predominantly political prisoners and the conditions were very horrible um, deliberately. Um, but when people died, it was quite often um, due to the poor kind of living conditions um, rather than any kind of deliberate policy of trying to murder them. Finally, we'll look at Nazi control of the legal system because Himmer realised that his opponents would stand little chance of success if trumped up charges could be brought against them and then being tried in courts which were biased in favour of the Nazis. So first of all, Hitler set up the National Socialist League for the maintenance of the law and he insisted that all judges must be members. This way, if the Nazis were unhappy with a judge, they could deny them membership. And this meant that Hitler could ensure that all judges would support Nazi ideas. Judges were instructed that if there was any conflict between the interests of the Nazi party and the law, the interests of the Nazi party were more important. The president of the German Academy of the Law said in 1936, the basis for interpreting all legal sources is the Nazi philosophy, especially as expressed in the party programme and in the speeches of our Führer. Next, Hitler abolished trial by jury because, of course, he couldn't have as much control over a jury. Instead, it was these already selected judges who got to decide innocence, guilt and punishments. Finally, Hitler set up a new people's court to hear all cases of treason offences against the state. Judges were handpicked and the trials held in secret. Hitler sometimes imposed sentences himself. For example, this is a letter that was sent from Hitler's private office about a man who was 74 years old and had been convicted of hoarding eggs. The Führer has seen a press cutting about the sentencing of the Jew, Marcus Luftgas, to two and a half years in prison. He desires that Luftgas should be executed. Please make the arrangements. There was no right to appeal against the verdict of the People's Court. And between 1934 and 1939, 534 people were sentenced to death for political offences. The picture that we see on the right is of Roland Freisler, a judge in the People's Court. He became well known for bullying defendants, shouting over their attempts to speak and verbally abusing them. About 90% of the defendants whose cases were heard by this man received the death penalty. So, next lesson, I've decided to skip over looking at policies towards the Catholic and Protestant churches because I'm going to combine that with looking at opposition from the churches in a later lesson. So I'm going to move on and look at how the Nazis controlled and influenced attitudes through propaganda and control of culture and the arts. So I'll hopefully catch you next week for that lesson. Goodbye.